Good afternoon. What we're going to do over the next several hours, and we will break it up into parts, so don't worry, you don't have to sit in front of your computer for seven hours or so. But what we're going to do is try to break it up into our segments, and we're going to talk about periodontal surgery, but with a full understanding biologically why each procedure is undertaken. The key to doing surgery really is beforehand knowing why. Because once you know why, the how becomes relatively easy. If you're a beginner, this is going to probably be a little over your head. Uh, it is critical, in my opinion, that you had watched part A with uh, a long seven-hour explanation of, of really uh, biology related to uh, keeping teeth. And we, talk, we talked about histology. We talked about physiology and everything, in which we're going to go again in this uh next several hours. We're going to break it down into, first we're going to start with flaps, which obviously you go through each procedure and we'll talk biologically why we do what we do. But we're going to start now with the uh, simplest area and we're going to work towards the most complex treatment, which will happen sometime about seven hours from now, if you don't mind. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about reflection of a flap in the posterior region. And what I want you to understand is, and, and a lot of you will, is that when you reflect a flap, you better know beforehand what you want. That scalpel is going to do nothing more than what you tell it to do. And if you don't know really biologically what you're doing, you may create bigger problems several years down the road than you expected. But the reason I start with the posterior is for, it's for obvious that if you do make a little mistake in the posterior, it's not as significant as making a mistake in the anterior. And so when we look at our reflection of our flap or, or treatment related to a flap, the most crucial part of, of which all, all these are, but is understanding you want maximum blood supply to the flap that you're reflecting. Because if you do, it's going to have nutrition over the next week and should do very, very well. When you compromise blood supply, that's when you get necrosis and that's when you get a lot more discomfort for the patient. The less trauma that you create for the tissue, again, the better the healing will be. And that's what we're going to talk today or over the next several hours is how to handle tissue, how to treat bone and so on so that it's atraumatic. We want to be very careful with our papilla because that's how we prevent black triangles. And certainly uh, we want to understand that there's a certain thickness of papilla. And if you create too thin of, an, of a papilla, you can get sloughing. The objective is, is to take the tissue, reflect it, have it go to sleep while you're doing your surgery, and then replace it just coronal to the bone and as close to primary closure as you can and making sure the flap is immobile. And if you treated it kindly at a week, you won't even know you did surgery. And so... We're going to look mainly here, you know, we're going to talk um, in a couple hours about biologic width, but this is more about how to make an incision. And a lot of times I see people talking about uh, reflecting a intracircular inter flap where you go along the uh, enamel and you simply reflect the flap back. And the problem here is you're reflecting epithelium. The problem with epithelium is that it sloughs every seven days. So what appeared again, there it is. We know this is a junctural epithelium, but that's nothing more, again, to epithelium. There's no real connective tissue in it. <clears throat> so that, <clears throat> excuse me, if you were to make an incision and try to reflect back the epithelium, in fact, when you replace your flap, you could actually be creating a situation that it could not attach because there's epithelium that will disappear in a week. And this could prevent, actually, attachment of the flap. You may not know about it for a year, but you may get what's called a long junctural epithelial attachment, which is very weak. So we want to remove this portion of the tissue. Whether we remove a little connective tissue really, in my opinion, doesn't matter. The key is to make sure that all the intercircular and junctural epithelium is removed. So we'd like our incision to be 
angled so that it hits the bone. And this, to me, would be done this way, whether we're doing a full thickness flap or a partial thickness flap. And so this obviously is a case where there is periodontal disease, which hopefully most of the cases we're treating are for a reason. We're not just doing it for the heck of it. So our incision is going to run at an angle almost like you could say parallel to the tooth. And it is key that it hits bone. You don't really want your first incision to come out in the tissue. You'd rather have it come out and then hit bone at, again, as I say, a parallel angle. And we're going to remove all this epithelium. We don't want it. And then we can come in here if you want to then take your scalpel and come along here, you know, and hit the bone again. But what I usually do is take an 11 or 12 uh, curette or a, a Goldman Fox number four, and I'm going to scoop out all this in, all this epithelium, plus many times this tissue is going to be made up of granulation tissue, which is from inflammation, which is very poor tissue, and we never want to take it with us in the flap. And then part three, again, you would scoop this area out, and you would take it out with a, you know, a number four Goldman Fox. This tissue should not be included into the flap. So it's crucial that you remove all epithelium and granulation tissue that all the intercircular and junctural epithelium is removed. So we'd like our incision to be angled so that it hits the bone. And this, to me, would be done this way whether we're doing a full thickness flap or a partial thickness flap. And so this obviously is a case where there is periodontal disease, which hopefully most of the cases we're treating are for a reason. We're not just doing it for the heck of it. So our incision is going to run at an angle almost like you could say parallel to the tooth. And it is key that it hits bone. You don't really want your first incision to come out in the tissue. You'd rather have it come out and then hit bone at, again, as I say, a parallel angle. And we're going to remove all this epithelium. We don't want it. And then we can come in here if you want to then take your scalpel and come along here, you know, and hit the bone again. But what I usually do is take an 11 or 12 uh, curette or a, a Goldman Fox number four, and I'm going to scoop out all this, all this epithelium. Plus many times this tissue is going to be made up of granulation tissue, which is from inflammation, which is very poor tissue, and we never want to take it with us in the flap. And then part three, again, you would scoop this area out and you would take it out with a, you know, a number four Goldman Fox. This tissue should not be included into the flap. So it's crucial that you remove all epithelium and granulation tissue, which you hopefully had left on the tooth or in that area, and then take your flap, which is just healthy tissue. So we must remove all the epithelium as it's going to slough away in seven days and create, and this could create a, a situation where your tissue does not attach other than a long junctural epithelium. And again, what we want to look at is, and I show this to you because there's a huge difference between a full thickness flap, which we're going to go over each individual one. But in either case, in my real opinion, is that if we angle down and we hit bone, I don't care. That would be my first start of full thickness flap, no, no matter what, is straight down. This is a split thickness flap, again, where you would just say remove the epithelium and junctional epithelium and keep the connective tissue. Um, more power to you if you do this. I'm very comfortable with A and B. Either one is important. But I, I kind of like the fact with that we're going to, in fact, keep more tissue in the flap so you can't perforate as much. But here, again, if you want to come straight in and remove just the circular area, that's fine. But remember, you now have to make another incision coming straight down. And so we're going to talk about the reflection of a flap in the posterior region. For obvious reasons, again, let's start learning the most safe area to treat and, and treating the flap in the posterior, by the way, is totally different than the anterior. And where I prefer to use is a 12D blade for the mandibular arch. It's double cutting, both sides cut. 
which allows you to go back and forth, mesial to distal, distal to mesial. And it's just my preferred burr, excuse me, my preferred scalpel. If you find you can use something different, you use what works for you. This is what works for me. And so what I do, there's my 12D. And the key to doing a interproximal flap is that your 12 goes as far lingually as possible. And it meets up with, you know, in the middle of the, of the tooth and approximately is what we call the col, an area that's just kind of area of epithelium, which again serves no purpose. So we would come from a distal or mesial and we would go as far lingually as possible so that we can take as much of the papilla as possible. The beauty of having provisionals is we can go farther lingually. If you have natural teeth, without crowns or provisionals, let's say, I should say provisionals, you can't go very far. And you're not going to get as much of a papilla as possible, which is going to prevent you from getting primary closure if, if you can. And so you're going to go from the distal first and then the mesial, and now you're going to lift out, never removing it, this beautiful thick papilla, which you're going to be able to lay back and it's going to fill in as much as possible the interproximal to help to get primary closure and also to help to prevent black triangles, even in the posterior. And so when we move to the maxillary arch, we have the same concept. We're going to use a different scalpel. We're going to use a 12C blade. It's pretty thin, pretty narrow. And we're going, going to go as far lingually as possible. We want to get the largest papilla we can. So we want to go from the distal. Again, if you're really, you know, you've been doing surgery for a while, you could do this in one simple movement. You would go as far distal as possible. Uh, I mean, on the distal, as far lingually as possible, and simply turn your blade and come back around the, the other angle, line angle right out, and the papilla would be full. But if you're, you know, you're not that comfortable and approximately, then you would simply go to the Lingual as far as possible, then come over to the mesial and go to the lingual again as far as possible. And you would be able to pull out a nice, big, beautiful papilla. Notice how it's formed. It's formed exactly the way we want it to look after we completed our surgery. Always try to think before you start, how do you want the end result? Don't just start. Start in your mind envisioning what the end result should look like. And so when we move to the lingual, it's a similar motion. We want to go now as far to the buckle as possible. See what we're trying to do? We're trying to keep our papillas fat and thick. Now remember, if there's granulation tissue, we always want to remove any inflamed tissue. We don't want to carry that with our flap. So that's going to be your decision, and I'm going to show you as we move along what granulation tissue looks like, and it's going to be your decision as to when to remove inflamed tissue, which you should do 100% of the time, but you may have to think a little harder how to keep the papilla as full as possible. But again, we move to the distal. We went from the mesial, <clears throat> as you can see here. Now we go to distal, and we're going to take that papilla out as thick as possible. Now, I find this to be very interesting because when I started out doing surgery, I was always taught to do large areas of large papilla, excuse me, large flaps, so that I would get maximum blood supply. And as time goes on, I see we're getting into these tiny little flaps. And in my opinion, little flaps, you see less, you tend to tra uh, traumatize more and you can also do decrease blood supply. And that's why we always make our flap in a trap of trapezoid form where the base of the flap is larger because that means there's going to be more blood supply to the flap. The flap should always have a large base. So I like to take pictures that are kind of incorrect and just explain why. Never ever would you want to make an incision on the direct buckle 